Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's adult AML chapter event brought to you by the Health Tree Community for AML program. My name is Katie Braswell, and I'm the Director of Education at the Health Tree Foundation. I'm very grateful to have each of you here for our meeting today and for your support in building this adult AML community. I'd like to let you know that today's session will be recorded and the recording along with any resources we discuss today will be sent via email to all registrants within 48 hours after the event has concluded. I'll start with a brief Zoom meeting tutorial for those of you that are new to using the platform. We would love for you all to turn on and keep your cameras on if you feel comfortable. Doing so helps us to create a stronger sense of community. You can see on the slide how to turn on your camera. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the microphone and camera buttons. You can click the video icon that says start video in order to turn your camera on. With that being said, if you're not comfortable being recorded, you're not required to keep your camera on. Your microphones should currently be off and will be kept off by our team throughout the presentation. During the group discussion, you're welcome to unmute yourself once you're called upon. If you have any questions or comments for us or for our speaker throughout her presentation, please click the chat icon and type them in the chat box. If you're using a mobile device or a tablet, click the three dot icon that says more and then chat in order to access the chat box. And lastly, if you would prefer to verbally ask a question or make a comment directly to our speaker during the discussion time at the end, we encourage you to do so. If you're using a laptop or a desktop, click reactions near the bottom of your screen and then click raise hand. If you're using a mobile device or tablet, you can click the three horizontal dots that say more and then click the raise hand button. First, I'd like to thank our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible, Servier, Estella's Pharma, and AbbVie. And secondly, I'd like to provide everyone with an exciting announcement before we get started. Um, the Health Tree Foundation is expanding. We initially started our foundation to support multiple myeloma patients and caregivers. And after 10 years of doing so, we then started our AML division. And over the past six months, we've been working really hard on getting MDS and CLL divisions off the ground. Uh, if you follow our news articles, you've seen that Health Tree is now extending our reach and we will soon have programs and resources for all people with blood cancer. We're working on starting news websites for the remaining types of leukemia, all types of lymphoma, as well as MPNs. And then we'll start hosting events for these communities as well. I'll be leading all of these efforts. So today I'd like to introduce you to Mary Arnett, who will be leading our AML events from now on. Uh, Mary, do you wanna hop on? Oh, I see your camera's on now um, and say hello and tell everyone just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so it's great to meet you all today. Um, like Katie said, my name's Mary. I have been at Health Tree for just about a year now. I came on last year to start and run our MDS division. Um, and now that Katie has been promoted, and I'm sure you can all agree with me, that it is very well deserved. She's done an amazing job uh, with building the AML community, um, and she'll be now helping with all of the blood cancers. Um, so now I'm going to be also working on the AML division, and I'm really excited to get to know all of you um, and to be able to help build this AML community. I'm very passionate about health education and about advocacy and helping to make sure that everyone is able to receive the best resources, education, and care that they can. Um, so that is something I'm really excited to work on with this AML community. Thanks, Mary. We're so excited to have you. I love working with Mary um, over the past, gosh, it's almost coming up on a year now. Um, I know. Time Next flies. Month. So it's crazy. Um, please know I'll definitely still be around um, and likely attending these events because I just love all of you guys and interacting with you and, and learning about AML. I learn something new every time we, we have these events from you and from our speakers. So um, I'll be around. Please do not hesitate to email me at any time. Okay, so now let's get started with today's event. Uh, the topic of our event today is titled, What You Need to Know About MRD, The Basics. Here's the agenda for today. I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Zhang, and she will spend the next 30 to 40 minutes giving us her presentation. After the presentation, we'll open it up for your questions and comments and end the event with a few announcements. Please feel free to um, interact throughout the presentation. We would love to take your questions um, through the chat or the raise hand feature. 
So let me take a second to introduce our speaker, Dr. Zhang. Dr. Zhang is a hematologist, oncologist, and assistant professor of hematology at Stanford University School of Medicine. In addition to her medical degree, she holds a PhD in cellular and molecular immunology. In her clinical practice, she treats patients with all forms of hematological malignancies, offering specialized expertise in acute myeloid leukemia, including therapy-resistant cases. One of the things Dr. Zhang's lab is currently studying is the potential of a novel and non-invasive way of detecting measurable residual disease in AML patients throughout their disease course, really making her the perfect person to talk with us about MRD in general um, today. So we're honored to have her here and really excited to learn. Um, so with that, Dr. Zhang, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, I'm going to just introduce myself kind of and then try to share the talk let's see if I'll just share my <laughs> I minimized it here we go um let me know is this you can see my slide yes looks okay good. great um well welcome everyone I, I definitely want this to be a conversation so it does not have to be me talking to all of you for 30 to 40 minutes um, before anyone asks a question. Um, I truly believe in teaching my per my own patients um, about AML and what I would consider to be the spectrum of myeloid diseases, and that's the M in AML. Um, the reason why I teach them about it is because I think you are definitely your, your best own advocates. And when you understand what is happening um, with your body, what's going on in the bone marrow and what's in the blood, um, what the numbers mean and what the tests mean, you are better informed. You hopefully are less anxious and you can even find um, things that slip through the crack by asking, hey, was this supposed to be done? I think that's what you taught me. And so um, I very much want this to be a very basic talk. Um, I'm actually gonna start with um, what AML, what blood is, what blood is consisted of, what we're looking for when we're doing bone marrow biopsies and checking your blood and how all of that is really related to this idea of tracking or testing for uh, MRD, which is depending on how you look at it, it either means minimal residual disease or it means measurable residual disease. And um, myself falls into the latter of the camp because it's just more literal and that it's um, um, measurable. And so um, just... Thank you, Katie, for the wonderful introduction, but just to fly through it, um, I am a clinician um, as well as a, a scientist. And so we're sort of called physician scientist. Um, and we're called that because what I love to do is to take the skills and the knowledge and the ability to conduct experience and, uh, experiments and guide other people in creating useful science in the lab which can then be used to inform the medicine that we practice and hopefully make your lives better. And then collect information on the clinical side, which then hopefully gets translated back into the lab to make more improvements on what we did. And so I sort of consider this as the full circle of what a physician scientist does in translating the work we do research in the lab into the clinic and then back again with iterative improvements in how we take care of you. Um, and so with that, I run a research lab in addition to taking care of patients on both the inpatient side and the clinic for acute myeloid leukemia. And I know you guys just mentioned MDS. And so I am an expert in AML, MDS, another entity called CCAS or Cytopenia of unclear significance and, and a precursor of all of these things called CHIP or clonal hematopoiesis. And so I'm actually happy to answer any questions that you guys have on any of those um, entities, plus what we're talking about today. 
um, a little bit about what my lab does. We don't need to focus on this. I One of the things I do is MRD um, as listed here on the right upper corner, but I also conduct clinical trials and I run the CHIP clinic, as I mentioned in the left lower hand corner. Um, so to start with, just to talk about and focus everybody's attention, we are talking about AML, which is acute myeloid leukemia. We'll get into why it's called that. But essentially, it's a um, condition that affects people who are elderly. And elderly means many things these days because, you know, I think of 60s, the new 50s, 70s, as the new 60s. So what does elderly really mean? By this picture right here, um, to us, older or elderly still means 60 and above. And so that means that the median or almost the average age of diagnosis for folks with AML is 68 to 69 years old, which means that by definition, this is a disease that affects the much older population, which is all, always more vulnerable for various reasons. Um, the incidence, which also means essentially how many people we diagnose with AML on a per year basis, is sort of a concept where we say one out of 10,000 versus one out of 100,000. And I think Katie um, mentioned, made a comment um, in the beginning about um, AML being 1% of all the cancers that's diagnosed um, annually, and that makes it a rare disease. And that is true. It doesn't feel like it's a rare disease for me because that is all I do all day long. Um, but the incidence rate, for example, for AML is one in um, 10,000, which is the actual definition of a real, um, of a rare disease. And so here is essentially a graph that shows you on the bottom x-axis people's age in categories by decades. On the y-axis is the rate per 100,000 of people that gets diagnosed. And then the different um, lines and signs essentially reflect people of different ethnicities and how frequently we are diagnosing AML in many of these ethnicities. And so as you can see, um, we rarely find them in people less than the age of 40. Around this time is when we're starting to find mutations that we'll get to later that could potentially predict somebody's risk of developing something. Um, you guys don't see the little mouse, right? I'm gonna turn it into a laser. Can you see the laser? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so this line, which is fairly flat here up to the age of 50 to 54 um, is what I was saying that you rarely or even more rarely diagnose AML in people less than 40 years of age. Age 40 and above is when we start to pick up things that might predict someone's risk of developing AML or something else later. Um, and you can see that as somebody ages, as they travel down this bottom axis here, the risk um, or the number per 100,000 of AML diagnoses actually increases quite a bit, especially between the fifth and the sixth and the seventh decade of someone's life with a very, very steep slope going up. And so this is what I meant by saying that this is really a condition that affects the most vulnerable, the elderly population, where perhaps some people um, up to the age of 65, if you will, are able to get what we would call high intensity chemotherapy. Whereas many of the folks that are older in this very arbitrary line um, are not able to get high intensive treatment and that are on low intensity treatments, which are just as effective. And so the high intensity and the low intensity doesn't necessarily um, predict whether you will do better or less. It's just the way of um, roughly quantifying how much um, chemotherapy we are giving someone. 
And so this tells us that um, a huge proportion, over 50% of the patients who are diagnosed at the time that they're diagnosed are really not very, um, are, are not considered healthy or strong enough or young enough to get high intensity treatment. And that has ramifications on tracking or measuring um, MRD, which we'll talk about more later. And so this is a very sobering slide that reflects the overall survival of patients with AML. And not to belabor the point, um, but what's shown on the x-axis is number of years someone is alive after diagnosis. And the Y is how many people or what proportion of people are alive. And so we don't need to talk about it specifically, but you can, anyone can see that past the three or five year mark, most of the lines depend, no matter the race, ethnicity, um, age group, the line sort of precipitously drops down, which means that many patients die of their, their AML or treatment related complications. Um, but the line does flatten out in that the further out you are after achieving remission, the better chances of you um, of being cured from this condition. And so as far as measuring the amount of disease of AML that is around in somebody's body, the idea of tracking it in the beginning of the phase within a year of diagnosis is very different compared to the idea of tracking MRD when someone is in the surveillance or cure phase where they may or may not be getting treatment, but we're all wondering, well, what is the level of AML that we can detect um, in our bones? but most of us hate bone marrow biopsies. And so this phase of the tracking or detection or the pickup of MRD or measurable residual disease is really hard to do because nobody who is a survivor and potentially be cured of AML really wants to have repeat bone marrow biopsies every three, six, nine, even on an annual basis. Um, we want you want to go out and live your lives and we want you to do that. And so this is why um, what why I have decided we need to invent and implement better ways of tracking MRD in a non-invasive way that hopefully doesn't require you to get um, bone marrow biopsies. But that is very much still um, in the research phase, if you will, but I believe that I or my team can make it happen really. Um, certainly in my lifetime, and I'm actually hoping in the next 10 years or so. So to be determined on that. Um, I do wanna pause and just kind of um, ask if anybody has had any questions that they want answered during this introduction phase. And, Usually if one person asks us a question, then other people are less shy about asking a question. No one, I, I can't really see what's in the chat. Can you just let me know if anybody raises their hand? Sure, I'm not seeing anything okay. currently. That's okay. Um, so moving on. Okay, so that's my spiel about AML who gets it. Everybody across races gets it. We actually don't know a lot about the different races and what we what types of AML we we are gonna find, and the community is working on that. We know that it is a condition that affects older people, and we know that older people can't handle very aggressive chemotherapy, and some people go on to um, get treated and cured and stop therapy. Other people are not able to get that kind of curative therapy and are on something called maintenance treatment. And that can go on essentially indefinitely. And so the idea of tracking a measurable disease is important 
to continue to assess whether somebody responded, how well they responded, and whether they continue to respond once treatment is stopped. And then lastly, if they are getting continuous maintenance treatment, because we're so afraid of relapses once treatment stops, is there a smarter and better way to capture the amount of MRD or measurable residual disease during the continuous maintenance treatment um, phase of the patient's treatment without having to um, perform invasive bone marrow biopsies? I think Alan has his hand raised. Go ahead, Alan. Yeah, hi. Um, so are you advocating that uh, patients, so so I'm I I had my bone marrow transplant uh, February of 2021. Um, uh, I relapsed uh, less than three months late, a little over three months later at day 97. Um, and, but since then, I um, I have been in remission since then. Um, so are you advocating that that we sh that I or just in general that we patient AML patients should be getting a a biopsy done on an annual basis? No. What I'm saying is ideally we are able to use a method to accurately detect low levels of AML remaining for folks like you. You're in a remission, but you may or may not wonder periodically what's happening in your bone marrow. Your transplant doc and your leukemia doc hopefully isn't saying, let's do annual bone marrow biopsies. We know how that sounds. We don't want you to have them. What I'm advocating is, is, is for a new way of liquid biopsy from your blood to be invented so that we can capture the information without having to do invasive annual bone marrow biopsies. The physicians want to do them to have reassurances that everything is good and that no relapses are happening. So for example, when you, you unfortunately relapse um, right after transplant, right now we have no way of predicting when that would have happened. Had we done a monthly bone marrow biopsy and looked for recurrence, Maybe we would have caught it um, two weeks before, maybe three weeks, maybe four, and that's the best we can do. I want there to be a sensitive, accurate, non-invasive liquid biopsy without having to get a bone marrow biopsy done that we would have done and said, Alan, let's track you every month after transplant and look for relapse, and we would have that information. That's what I'm advocating for. Okay. So how is that how is that done today though? How do you I mean how do you go about detecting MRD then today? Yeah. I'm going to tell you how we do that today and then I will tell you how it should be done. Okay? So to that's a very good question that segues into how do we measure it? How do we measure anything has to do with counting the number of bad amongst the number of good. That's simply what it is. Um, there are several methods by which you can count the number of cells. So the historical method, well, I should back up for a second and introduce the idea of um, how blood is made essentially in your bone marrow by this diagram. And then we're gonna talk about what happens with AML and how to count these number of cells and that is what MRD assays do. How many leukemia cells do you have in your total body based on the variety of tests and technologies that we have? Um, and I'll get to each of them. So how we diagnose and count AML cells is such as this. Um, all the blood that we have in our bodies comes from a cell called the hematopoietic stem cell. I think everyone knows the term stem cell. It means it has self-renewal potential in that once this cells divide, 
it can continue to make another stem cell just like itself. All other cells in our body are not able to completely make a accurate copy. We lose a little bit of it and mature a little bit, just kind of like after we get born, um, we don't maintain a brand new baby, we grow. And as we grow, we mature and become less and less like a baby. So same thing happens with stem cells. And that process is called mature maturation or maturing or differentiation, differentiating other cells, mature cells that we find on the bottom, which are in the blood from the stem cells or the baby cells of where it comes from. So the top of this graph is what lives in your bone marrow. And the bottom of this picture is what circulates in your blood. When we draw blood from your arm, we are counting the number of platelets, red blood cells, neutrophils, T cells, B cells, NK cells, these cells as AML patients, you're less keyed into. I teach my patients how to count their neutrophils, their red blood cells and platelets because we transfuse you, we put your own medicines for it. Well, where do these cells come from? They come from the bone marrow, which is why to diagnose somebody with AML, we 99% of the time perform a bone marrow biopsy because we must look at the stem and the stem cell differentiated cells from the stem cell. What is happening here? And so everybody probably is familiar with the term blasts on this call, because that is the scary cancer AML cell that we call. AML patients have more than 20% blasts in the bone marrow, which are these immature stem cell-like cells that are not differentiated and have not entered the bloodstream. And when these cells grow over a proportion of the total number of cells in your bone marrow at an arbitrary 20% that was set way um, long time ago based on the technology that they had at the time and said more than 20% is acute myeloid leukemia or AML, less than 20% sometimes is MDS or high-risk MDS or it could be low-risk MDS and there are other terms called myeloid neoplasms that we don't need to focus on today. But essentially, AML arises in the bone marrow, and we must look there for now. Um, what it is is that we're all born with a, with a finite number of stem cells, actually, and I think most people don't know that. By the time you're born, you have all the HSCs for the stem cells we're ever going to have. These guys don't like to divide because they need to maintain self-renewal and maintain their stemness. And if you divide too much, you lose these guys and are not able to self-renew. So these guys mark themselves as a copy. It divides and makes two copies. One copy is marked as a stem cell. The other copy goes down this very um, simplified tree where they differentiate or mature down either what's called the lymphoid lineage or the myeloid lineage. The myeloid is the M in AML. This part of the diagram, we're going to kind of just put away because we're not talking about lymphoid blood cancers. That would be CLL, multiple myeloma, lymphoma, and other lymphoid or L blood disorders. That's how those guys get made. On the myeloid side, through several intermediates that the stem cell differentiates into, these progenitor cells go on to make specific cell subtypes that then makes all the cells that keep us alive. So this guy can make another cell called a megakaryocyte, and these guys enter the bloodstream and bled off platelets. And that's how we have platelets that helps us with bleeding, um, stopping bleeding, et cetera. This guy always also makes another guy that goes on to make red blood cells. And these guys come out of the bone marrow and circulate 
And, you know, when your hemoglobin gets below eight or seven, depending on where you are, you get transfused. So essentially, they're also made in the bone marrow. The other cell types important for us is the neutrophils. That's your first line of defense. Everybody's heard of neutropenic fevers and it being an emergency. And so most of the very important cells that sustain life by carrying oxygen and make us not bleed or stop the bleeding when we have an injury come from the myeloid side of this chart. And that's important to know because AML is a condition that is essentially started by serial acquisition or serially picking up bad mutations that starts at the stem cell level. And so you can have one mutation here. And by the time this guy becomes this guy, this guy could have picked up another two mutations. You live another decade. This guy grows, makes other cells, comes down here. These guys gain more mutations, maybe three, maybe four, maybe five. And when they pick up just the wrong combination of mutations, it allows these guys to grow too quickly, exceeding the 20% that we all know that causes a diagnosis of AML. When these guys grow too much, they don't allow blood like platelets and red blood cells and neutrophils from being made. This is why AML patients are anemic. They don't make platelets, they're at risk for bleeding and they're anemic and they need transfusions and they're at higher risk for infection. It's because these baby cells are growing out of control and cannot be shut down. So when you first, you know, feel like something is wrong, you probably are bruising easily or you had a fever, you just weren't feeling well. And those feelings are caused by these cells in your bloodstream being low. So you go and you get checked and, you know, that's called a complete blood count. People tell you or your numbers are too high or they're too low. And they say, well, you need to go get a bone marrow biopsy. So you go and get that done. They're taking a snapshot of what's happening with these stem and progenitor cells and counting essentially the number of AML cells in the bone marrow to make the diagnosis of AML. And let's just say that you can make that. If you count 100 cells under the microscope, because we've had that technology for a long time, if 20 out of the 100 cells are AML blasts, then that's how the diagnosis of 20% 20, 20 in AML gets made. Of course, we count more than 100 cells in most cases. And so you might be surprised that actually we only count 200 to tell you whether you're in remission or not. And it doesn't sound like a huge number. When we do a bone marrow biopsy, we take out millions and millions of cells. The first step is the pathologist taking a little bit drop of the blood that came out of, or I should say the bone marrow blood or the bone marrow aspirate put it on a microscope slide and simply just look under the microscope and count. Sometimes they have the patients to count more than 200 and most of the time they will stop at 200. And if that number is more than 40, which makes 20% of 200, then your diagnosis is AML. Well, you might say, well, that doesn't sound like a lot of cells people are counting to make such a serious diagnosis. And I would be more inclined to agree with that. And we're gonna come back to that concept in a little bit. Um, and so I wanna talk a little bit more about this and that essentially this is how the diagnosis of AML is made. It is made by counting the number of bad cancer cells called AML blasts in the total number of cells that we take by doing a bone marrow biopsy, okay? The idea of MRD is built on top of this counting of AML cells out of the totality of all of the cells in the bone marrow. That includes everything on the top part of this picture. I'm going to pause again and just ask if there are any um, unclear words, vocabulary that I said, because that's 
probably the concept that we're going to build on top of by counting cells and introduce the idea of MRD. We're good. Okay. So back way back when in 1976, all we had were microscopes, slides, and the human eye and some very simple stains. That's what I was talking about. We do a bone marrow biopsy. We take some amount of cells out. We put them on a slide and the pathologist looks at it, counts how many ML cells out of 200. You get the diagnosis and what the cell types look like. And that's what's called a morphological classification. Morphology means form or what it looks like. So simply it is very succinct and descriptive. This is a um, form of form classification of what the AML is by looking at the cell. And that is based on the limit of the technology they had in the 1950s, 60s, 70s. I know the microscope has been around longer, but we didn't figure out how to do that, to use it to count bone marrow cells until about then, okay? So a bunch of technological advances happened um, throughout the 80s, 90s, even the 2010s. Um, what really happened in the 20 teens, 2010 um, through, I would say, about 2020, is an explosion of what's called next generation sequencing um, technologies. Um, this group of technologies allowed us to not just count the number of cells under the microscope by counting up to 200. This is a different concept of taking all the cells out and extracting all the DNA out of the cells, out of all the cancer cells, and looking for the mutations that I talked about that occurs and arises in these stem and progenitor cells that we can see, that we know are related to AML. And the way we discovered this is essentially by sequencing over a thousand AML patients' cancers in allowing us to essentially make a giant table of all these bad mutations that are found in AML patients. So that's what allowed us to define AML, not just by what they look like under the microscope, but what they are expressing what's mutated and what's wrong with them. And I think if you've been diagnosed and if you like Alan have had a transplant, then you know that um, there are three essentially buckets or flavors. There's the favorable, there's the intermediate, and then there's the higher adverse risk. The discovery of these mutations in the AML cells allowed us to classify them by mutation. And that's what the European Leukemia Net or the ELN or the WHO or the NCCN or the IWG. So overwhelmingly classification of AML and MDS and CICA of the entire myeloid um, lineage of cells is becoming using somatic mutations, which are basically just genes in your blood stem cells and its baby cells and progeny that went wrong and got mutated for a variety of reasons and didn't allow these cells to grow and differentiate. They got stuck in a very immature, undifferentiated state and it's causing issues. And so, after the invention and the prices of next generation sequencing coming down, we now very much use molecular testing to determine um, uh, mutations that it's associated. And so that actually opened up a whole different way of tracking MRD. And it's very different because on the old ways required us to count the number of cells. That's by microscope, another method called flow cytometry. And I'll spend a little bit more time on that. 
but we're breaking it down into looking at the actual cells by themselves and counting them by methods versus not counting the cells, but counting the copies of number of mutations that live within these cells. Because when you do it at the molecular level, you can be much sensitive, meaning that instead of catching only one out of 200 by looking at it under the microscope, you can get down to one in a million copies of a gene within a group of cells. They're different concepts, but even if they were the same concept of counting physical cells, we I think we can all understand one in a million is much deeper and more sensitive in catching measurable residual disease by genetic mutations. Okay, two categories, counting by cell number, counting by somatic mutation copy. Old way is counting by number, one out of 200. Then came along flow cytometry, which is the gold standard, if you will, if you will or the standard of care right now in AML. And that is a special technique to not belabor it, is to look for one in 10,000 cells. Essentially, we do a bone marrow biopsy. We take a group of cells out. We run it through a machine in a tiny little water droplet stream where we can count faster each water droplet going by. Each water droplet has a cell in it. Goes by, it looks like AML is counting. Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. We count 10,000 cells, which means that by definition, the flow cytometry test, which is still counting the number of cells, is 100 times more sensitive than the test by which pathologists use to count cells on the microscope. So already you made a leap from one in 100 to one in 10,000, which is a hundredfold more. And with molecular assays, of which there are very few right now for AML, you can get down as deep or as low or as sensitive, all the same meaning, in one in a million copy, which is in fact less than one in a million cell because each cell has actually millions, if not billions of copies of genes and variety, not all related to AML um, mutations. And so you kind of have to trust me a little bit in there in that the molecular measurable residual disease or MRD is the most sensitive test we have, but really it's not standard of care. Um, it has to do with the technology be not being quite mature enough for us to be detecting multiple genes that are associated and mutated with AML down to one in a million. We can do at a one gene at a time, but I want us to be able to do hundreds at the same time. And I want us to be able to do it without having to look in the bone marrow. Um, so I said a lot there as far as just math and ratios and I see one chat comment. Um, I can't see it though. Oh, I can. How far along is personalized drug testing for AML to line up for the test? Yeah. So perfect question. Um, there are, so you're talking about targeted therapies that target specific mutations that have a drug. There's three. There is one drug for FLT3 ITD mutations. There is a drug for IDH1 mutations, and there is a drug for IDH2 mutations. We absolutely use next generation sequencing methods that I listed to detect molecular responses um, to be able to pick up. So you get diagnosed, I take some of your cells, I take the DNA out and I, I run it through the sequencer and I say, 
Do you have a three, FLT3 IgG mutation? Do you have an IDH2 mutation? Or do you have an IDH1 mutation? If we find one, then great. We can borrow these available FDA approved drugs, combine it with other chemotherapy and give that to you. Um, the testing is available for diagnosis, but there is a big difference in being able to pick up the mutation when your bone marrow is full of AML cells very easy to do. But let's say you get diagnosed, right? Lots of blasts here at the time of diagnosis, um, maybe sometimes circulating. You get chemotherapy. We wipe out most of the um, really bad AML blasts within the bone marrow. So then the pathologist looks at that biopsy and says, oh, less than 5% of your 200 cells that I counted which is 20, I think 5%, 5% of 100 is five, yeah, 10, 10 cells. So they're gonna count if you have 10, less than 10 cells of the 200, that's still AML, you are now in remission. But you could say, well, but I still have 10 cells, that is measurable residual disease because you are able to pick up AML, you can measure it, it's residual and it's still disease. So to say it very crudely, the level of detection with just your bone marrow biopsies by a pathologist is pretty crude by the standard of technology these days. Um, five, 10 cells out of 200 means you still have AML. So then we depend on this flow cytometry MRD test to tell us of the 10,000 cells, how many do you have? And if you've had AML and you've read reports, you have family members, then you know that those numbers come down to a few percentages. It could be it's definitely less than 5% because if you it's more than 5%, you're not in remission. But it is able to pick up 0.02% all the way up to 5%. So that MRD test by flow cytometry has already lowered the lower limit of detection from 10 out of every 200 down to essentially two in every 10,000 cells, which is where the number 0.02% comes from. So by the current standard of care, which is the flow cytometry test, we can detect one out of every 5,000, which is equivalent to two out of every 10,000 cells. And so that's where we're at with standard of care in AML. Um, this next question is, does MRD negativity reduce the likelihood of relapse? Yes, it does. I want to be precise and say, you mean flow cytometry MRD. There's lots and lots of studies that have come out since flow cytometry was implemented as the standard of care. So then everybody started ordering them, then everybody got them. And then we took a bunch of people who had flow MRD testing results together. We grouped them into flow MRD negative and MRD positive. It is perhaps intuitive and not a surprise to tell you that if your remission marrow is negative for MRD, for whatever reason, you whatever path you go on to have, whether it's just watchful waiting, whether it's transplant, these folks, because they had negative MRD, meaning that we couldn't pick up out of every 10,000 cells, two or more these guys have a way smaller chance of relapsing compared to the folks where we find somewhere between two up to hundreds of cells um, to make up the 5% of 10,000, right? It's actually probably, yeah, many hundreds. And so I can't give you a precise full difference between these guys who are MRD positive and MRD negative. And that's because many other factors go into relapse and not just the amount of residual disease, um, which is if you have positive MRD, what is your physician gonna do about it? 
Are they going to keep giving you treatment to make you MRD negative? Or in some cases, when somebody is MRD positive for too long, we actually pivot and refer that patient to transplant. And so what I can say is that positive MRD does predict, obviously, earlier relapse. Negative flow MRD predicts more likelihood to stay in remission, whether you go on to get more therapy or not. But the actual ratio of what what else makes this guy more likely to relapse has to do with the mutations that were found at the beginning of diagnosis, which predicts likelihood of relapse, the therapy that you got, the complications that, that may have happened because of the treatments. Um, and so that's more of a multifactorial, more complicated question to answer. Yeah. And the next question is, would a doctor even plan to postpone transplant if flow cytometry MRD is less than 5%? Um, the question of transplant is made right now, right off the bat in the beginning, based on how your cytogenetics, which we didn't talk about because that's even less, um, that's one in 20. So I kind of left that out because it's not very precise. We only count 20 cells, but it's relevant in this question because we use the cytogenetic, which are largely how how different your chromosomes look. Did it get rearranged? Did you lose a chromosome? Did you lose one of the arms or one of the chromosome? That has predictive value, but the somatic mutations has more predictive value and there's many more of them. And so um, whether a doctor makes a decision on transplant is based on whether you have the favorable or the intermediate or the high risk or adverse. If you're in the high risk adverse bucket, it doesn't matter what your MRD is, you need to go to transplant. We often actually give more therapy to reduce as much as possible the detectable MRD and to try to get it down to as close to zero as possible before you go to transplant. Um, so that's the typical situation. The, question you're asking is a little bit more nuanced because um, for favorable risk patients, for example, um, the goal is to cure them with um, one round of induction chemotherapy followed by perhaps three to four rounds of what's called consolidation chemotherapy and then stop. And so these folks, because they are favorable and because of other characteristics that made it favorable, typically do not have MRD at the end of their consolidation. But occasionally we do see positive MRD at the end of that. And when we see positive MRD and the plan was not to go forward with transplant in the beginning because that's a favorable risk AML person, then we do care very much a lot. We would want to either no therapy and wait to repeat a bone marrow biopsy later to see, because sometimes strange things happen and your body actually can fight off a certain level and it just evolves. I've had people who end up with positive MRD at the very end of their therapy. We just paused treatment and did a watchful waiting approach and did serial repeat bone marrow biopsies later on and showed that it totally went away. So in that case, then I was reassured and we didn't move forward with transplant. Um, but let's say that person kept on having measurable residual disease or MRD. If the number is stable on serial bone marrow biopsies, I probably wouldn't rush to transplant, mostly because it's such a huge ordeal for somebody to commit down to. And so unless I was super sure that someone is going to relapse by seeing the numbers increase, then if they're doing well and they're favorable, which means that they're very likely to go into another remission, I tend not to because I I just want to be conservative with, with, with what we do. Um, but you know, it is a little bit of experimental based and what I call dealer's choice in that other people may choose to take that positive MRD person to go to transplant. 
it also just depends on the mutation that that person have that tells you um, we all have there's publications and you read them and we as experts all have kind of a gut feeling on these guys just like to relapse and then we're more inclined to relapse um, to refer them to transplant if the MRD is positive. And so I'm sorry I'm being so vague, but AML has gotten so complicated with what to do and the number of treatments and the number of tests. It's become just very hard to make a very black and white answer, just like real life, everything is in gray. So um, I hope I answered most of your questions. I think I did. Um, so I also don't know what time it is. Are we running out of time, I think? We're getting pretty close. So I think if anybody else has a question, maybe you pose it now and, and um, yeah. we can have while, some closing remarks. Yeah. While you guys are talking or thinking about any other questions, what I will say is this, because Ellen asked about this liquid biopsy and how am I going to make that possible in my lifetime? And that has to do with knowing the recurrent somatic mutations that exist now. And so we have figured out a way, and you may have read this, it's called cell-free DNA, circulating tumor DNA, liquid biopsy. And that has to do with the idea that a bunch of AML cells here are growing and dying. They release little bits and pieces of themselves and their, soma their DNA and that carries the mutation. It actually just goes into circulation and enters um, the bloodstream. And so we figured out that by just taking blood from the bottom half, taking blood out, removing the cells, we can find enough fragments of the AML DNA that we're, re that we're living in the bone marrow. If we capture enough of these, we can put them into the same assay that we use with next generation sequencing to be able to find the type of mutations that um, was found in that person's bone marrow biopsy in the beginning of the diagnosis. And so that once you establish the type of AML you have in the future, we should be able to remove some blood from your pick line, your pore by poking your arm removing some blood, separating out the cells, looking for fragments that cells, normal cells and cancer cells shed into their environment that goes into the circulation that gets traveled. We take that information out, we sequence it, and we ask how many copies of this person's mutations that was found at the time of diagnosis can still be found. And that number might vary over time. And so you know, in the future, hopefully I will tell you that, um, how that's working. But what I can share is that we can pick up every single mutation that's associated in the AML and the bone marrow um, in a pretty good sized pilot cohort right now, which is why I'm confident that we can make that happen. So is it possible that MRD can look different, but be at the same level? I'm not sure I understand that question in the same person pre and post transplant, um, post treatment. Um, I think of MRD as a continuous thing that we're measuring that's either go up or down. Um, if you're asking, you know, if an MRD moves up and down, if it goes up, it means that something is happening, more AML cells are growing. Um, and if it goes down, it means that treatment might be happening and maybe killing the cells, the AML cells, and that would move the MRD down. And so um, I think maybe the distinction I should make for you is that at the time of diagnosis, it's not called MRD. That's just how much you have and what we need to kill. It's only called measurable residual disease after you've gotten some treatment. That's what the, so try to remember the R, it's residual disease after treatment. So it is different. It should go from a high number to a low number, but the high number is a diagnostic number. Only the lower numbers after treatment are considered to be MRD, okay? Okay.
Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. This was excellent and um, a great format for discussion for everyone in, in attendance. I'm really eager to follow your research on MRD and hopefully we can keep the group um, well informed of, of how oh. things are going. Yes. So if you, anybody will be at ASH or anybody reads ASH, um, abstracts, et cetera. So the research I just talked about with the liquid biopsies is getting published at ASH this year. And after that, I'm happy to do another one of these things if people are interested in knowing more about it. So I'll just say that. Okay. Great. Thank you we, so much we for the invite. Like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'll take just a few more minutes to mention our next event, um, which is actually going to be next week, uh, next Tuesday from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern. We're combining efforts with our myeloma community to hear from Kenny Capps, um, who's a health treat coach, blood cancer patient, and founder of Throwing Bones, a nonprofit whose mission is to educate and advocate uh, for individuals living with cancer to help them improve their quality of life through healthy and active lifestyles. So Kennedy, Kenny will share tips on how to stay motivated and discuss why fitness is such an important part of staying healthy along the blood cancer journey. And as I mentioned earlier, Health Tree is expanding to support all blood cancers. So we're hosting a launch event uh, during the evening of October 23rd to discuss more about our plans and how you can be involved in important research aimed at accelerating cures for AML through our Health Tree Cure Hub portal. Um, you can learn more about both of these events through and register for them through the link um, on this slide. And I'm also sending out an email, um, a post event email with this recording and the link for future events. Uh, once again, thank you to our Health Tree community for AML event sponsors, Servier, Estellas, and Ampi. And thank you to each of you for helping us build a, a strong Health Tree community for AML. I really appreciate you all um, and really hope to see you next week and at our launch event in October. And a big thank you to Dr. Zhang for being here with us today. So bye, everybody. I had fun. Bye, guys. Have a good day.